Should we be eating protein just at one time in the day? Is a vegan diet healthier than a non-vegan diet? Let's talk about it. Today we're doing a summary on some of the most popular nutrition related studies from the first quarter of 2024. I'm excited to talk about these studies. There is one, especially the protein related one that I'm most excited about. Being part of the science field, it is very important to just stay up to date on new information, keeping up to date on studies and just information in the field. It can become pretty dangerous if we believe that we know it all. And especially if we're too stuck on our specific beliefs about something scientific related. One of the ways that I love to keep myself informed is by being a member of examine.com. They are a huge resource that I have spoken about on various videos. I use them a lot whenever I do nutrition related MLM dives. When I talk about specific supplements and the ingredients in there, that is one of my most favorite resources. I want to talk about them really quick because I think they are so undervalued for what they provide. They're like an undervalued resource that I think more people need to know about. And by the way, this is not sponsored in any way, shape or form. So examine.com, they say it is the largest database of nutrition and supplement research on the internet. They have more than 30 researchers on their team. They were founded in 2011 as an education organization. They are not affiliated with any supplement or food company and their research team is contractually obligated to have no conflicts of interest. A little bit about how they're funded because that is important in my opinion. They are entirely an independent organization and they, and they do not accept any money from outside sources. They say, for the vast majority of nutrition websites, revenue is directly proportional to page views or products sold, whether they be supplement bottles or diet plans. Thus, rather than an even-handed and thorough interpretation of the evidence for many websites, sensationalism sells. Rather, 100% of our revenue is generated from additional research synthesis that we sell to both health professionals and lay people. All the information on the website is freely accessible. Those additional informational products are meant for those looking for added depth and step-by-step -step instructions. So I do pay for their membership to have access to more. They do not allow donors, sponsors, consulting clients, advertisements, or affiliations. And they have a very strict no gift policy for their staff members, even books that are sent their way. They don't take them. Now they do have referral codes and full disclosure for that for the referral code. They will pay you 33% lifetime commission on the Examine Plus membership price paid by the users you refer. So I will put my referral link in the description box down below. Just note that information and you don't have to use it, of course. Also, if this is important to you, they do not use artificial intelligence to generate their study summaries. They rely on their team of experts to interpret and contextualize the latest research. So as a member, I get emails and summaries about recent research that was published and just a lot of information on various aspects of health and they separate it into whether it's like cardiovascular related or diabetes related. Because of just my like time availability, I usually will focus on like the sports nutrition side of things. And it's not to say that I don't want to learn about other aspects, you know, like the renal side, oncology side, really like staying up to date on that side of things. It's just like, I can only handle so much. So I tend to focus more so on the sports nutrition and like overall wellness behaviorism focus kind of approaches and things like that. Digestive health too, anytime there's updates in there, I really like to just be aware. But when I was planning out my channel for this year, I thought it would be kind of cool if I could at least quarterly bring some of the more popular nutrition related studies to my channel and just discuss them. If you like to like nerd out on some of the more like science side of things when it comes to nutrition, you might appreciate it. So before we get into the studies, just know that some of them are a little bit more weight and weight loss focused and not necessarily looking at like the long-term effects, but looking at more like short-term effects from that weight change. Remember, it doesn't matter if there is weight loss, if the actions that was done to get to that, if it's not sustainable, then typically not really beneficial long term. Like with all of these, it's important to remember that it's one study and we need to look at other things, other factors before making large changes to implementation practices. Just kind of keep that in mind. We can't put everything, all of our like eggs in a basket of like one study. But if you are sensitive to weight talk, this might not be the best video for you. You might want to skip it and that's okay. We're going to be discussing 
discussing some of the nuance surrounding this because ultimately I am a dietitian who is focused on actions that are sustainable and making sure that what the person is doing is in alignment with their health, physical, mental, social, emotional well-being rather than just focusing on a specific number on the scale. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into study number one. So these study summaries are provided by Examine. I'll be referring to my notes for these because I don't want to get these wrong. Like I'll summarize the summary in some aspects, but I just want to make it clear like this is from Examine and I'm adding my commentary to it. All right, so the first summary is over the study that was titled Association of Dietary Adherence and Dietary Quality with Weight Loss Success Among Those Following Low Carbohydrate and Low Fat Diets, a Secondary Analysis of the Diet Fits Randomized Clinical Trial. And moving to Examine Notes, it said basically the best diet is the healthiest one that you can stick to. In the secondary analysis of a diet trial, participants experienced greater weight loss and improved health markers if they had both higher diet adherence and a higher diet quality, regardless of whether they ate a low carbohydrate or a low fat diet. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So the study was really looking at adherence to a specific way of eating in addition to the quality of the foods, right? Like the nutrient density of those foods and the differences between a low carbohydrate approach and a low fat approach. And the primary outcome that they saw was a change in weights, a decrease in weights, but there were also secondary outcomes, which included reduced blood pressure, reduced fasting glucose and insulin levels, and some changes in their LDL, which is commonly referred to as like the cholesterol that you don't want to have, like the bad cholesterol. So when we look at studies, an important factor is how many people were part of it. And if we're looking at an MLM product, most of the time, the number of participants is like 10. So right there, you know, not what we would put a whole lot of faith into as far as outcomes go, but this study was looking at 448 participants. This randomized control trial ran for one year. So in the original trial, the participants were assigned to follow either a low carbohydrate or low fat diet. And with both of those diets designed to be generally nourishing by emphasizing things like vegetables and like fiber rich carbohydrates. And in the secondary analysis, the investigators examined whether diet adherence and diet quality alone and in combination were associated with improvements in those various markers of cardiometabolic health in both diet groups. The nourishment factor of the intake was determined by something called the HEI, which is the Healthy Eating Index of 2010. In short, a higher HEI score involves consuming higher amounts of fruit fruits, vegetables, greens, beans, whole grains, dairy, total protein foods, seafood, plant proteins, and a higher ratio of unsaturated to saturated fat. Notice it doesn't say zero saturated fat, it's just the ratio. And on the flip side, lower amounts of more refined foods, refined grains, sodium, and calories that are often described as like empty. So especially things like alcohol. But I do get asked the question of like, should I do low carb or low fat? Like what is more beneficial? What I thought was really exciting though is more of like what we see lab value change wise. And as kind of a summary or one of the reasons why I wanted to discuss the study in particular was because it shows that it's not so much the approaches, like the getting in the weeds of everything, but when we can focus more so on nutrient dense foods, when we can focus on adding some fruits and vegetables here and there, getting in some beans, getting in some whole grains, like we don't have to be scared of carbohydrates. And I think in diet culture, it's very much like you're doing this diet or that diet and there's like zero room for gray. And one of my biggest goals is to show people that food, like the approaches can be very flexible and you don't have to do a diet like, focusing on these specific foods, there is room for variety and there is room for just 
preferences too. It can be really beneficial to focus on what can we add, what can we include in our intake rather than focusing on what to take away or what to like stop doing. The more that we can put our focus and our energy and our time into the inclusion of maybe some more variety and some of the key like challenges around that area, availability, accessibility, that is going to be worth more than like following these arbitrary diet rules and diet plans. And remember, it doesn't matter so much if the actions, if what you're doing is helping physical health, but it's really harming those other aspects of health, mental well-being, social well-being, and if it's really not sustainable, is it really going to be beneficial if it's not something that can be done for a longer time? Big thing from here that we can take away, focusing on the inclusion of more of those nutrient-dense foods and on the other side of things, making sure that we're providing kind of access and helping with access to those nutrient dense foods as much as possible. Just spending time on that rather than focusing on like what you shouldn't be doing. All right, the next study, this is the one that I'm really excited about because I think this one probably, as far as like all of these studies, I think this one provides more information that we really need to have more studies on. So this one, the question is, is there a limit to how much protein the body can use? So the study is called the anabolic response to protein ingestion during recovery from exercise has no upper limit in magnitude and duration in vivo in humans. So basically I wanted to talk about this and I think this is interesting. It is taught there is like a saturation point to where the effects or the results of eating more than let's say 30, 35 grams of protein, depending on the size of the person, of course, that the rate at which it is beneficial kind of like doles out almost. Like maybe not useless, but the zero to like 30 range is gonna be a lot more beneficial than like 30 beyond kind of range at a specific meal time. So they say, with respect to whole body protein synthesis, the reported finding is in agreement with previous research indicating that ingesting larger amounts of proteins in a single meal results in greater whole body protein synthesis rate and net protein balance. What makes the summarized study groundbreaking is that it is a first to demonstrate an apparent linear dose response relationship between the dietary protein intake and the muscle protein synthesis. And kind of what I was saying before, it is traditionally assumed that muscle protein synthesis is a saturated process. In other words, ingesting a certain amount of protein maximizes the muscle protein synthesis response and ingesting a larger amount of protein does not further benefit protein or muscle protein synthesis. Evidence for this statement comes from a collection of studies that measured the MPS response, which is mus muscle protein synthesis. I'm just going to say MPS. The evidence of that statement comes from a collection of studies that measured the MPS response to various amounts of whey protein over three to four hours. In those studies, it was shown that ingesting about 0.24 and 0.4 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight in younger and older adults, respectively, was sufficient on average to maximize that muscle protein synthesis response or MPS response. So based on this data, in combination with the idea that the MPS response is relatively short-lived, it has become recommended that people with the goal of maximizing anabolism, which is the like building of muscle, like gaining muscle mass, it's been recommended that people should consume a bolus of protein every few hours, as this would lead to several maximal MPS spikes throughout the day, thus maximizing the cumulative 24 hour MPS rate. So essentially like it has been recommended to have around that 30 grams, 25 to 35 grams, depending on, you know, the kilogram body weight, but roughly it comes out to that for many people having that every three to four hours, like at meal times, at snack times, it's been recommended to do that to maximize the amount of gains essentially. However, although it may be the case that a given amount of protein maximizes that response over three to four hours, 
juice and consuming a larger amount of protein does not further benefit within this period, that doesn't mean that this finding can be extrapolated to longer durations. Collectively, the results, it challenges that notions of consuming that every few hours is the best strategy for maximized anabolism or muscle gains. And they suggest that consuming larger amounts of protein less frequently is also a viable option. Rather, that excessive amount above that, like saturation amount being wasted or like wasted as as what was thought, we might not need to really harp so much on that three to four hour range time period. It may be the case that like two protein meals is just as good as a current best practice recommendation of four protein feeding times for maximizing that muscle growth. Now, I did want to say some of the limitations. So this study was on only 36 people. It was active young men without any apparent health conditions. They were aged 18 to 40. So not a large group of people, and I wish they would have included more variety of people. So that is definitely a limitation. Another important point is that until a proper randomized controlled trial is conducted, it cannot be said for certain whether less frequent, larger protein feedings have a comparison effect on muscle mass to the current best practice recommendation of consuming a protein bolus or protein amount containing about 0.4 grams per kilogram every few hours. In the meantime, people who are interested in maximizing their muscle growth, which includes a lot of athletes that I work with, you may want to play it safe and just stick to smaller, more frequent protein feedings. Like it demonstrates that we don't necessarily have to be eating like every three to four hours this amount of protein necessarily, as long as you make sure, of course, that overall total protein intake is adequate. And if you're looking to maximize muscle growth, that you're also participating in like a resistance exercise kind of training program. And it's also possible that the participation of being in a heightened anabolic state So the participants and their participation in physical activity that could increase their capacity to utilize those larger amounts of protein. So that's also something that needs to be taken into question when designing further studies. But that one was a huge one that I really wanted to talk about because that there is that recommendation in sports nutrition. One of the foundations around the protein side of things is the not only the total amount we have recommendations for that. So typically anywhere from like 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram is where I really like to have my athletes sit at. 1.75 is typically sufficient as well, grams per kilogram. But then we break that down further into meals every three to four hours just to maximize that kind of muscle protein synthesis. But interesting information. We might not need to do that as much. But again, that is still current recommendations. And just to play it safe. It's still something that I would recommend until we have a little bit more information. All right. The last study that we're talking about this one, I've gotten so many questions over. There have been a lot of like news publications talking about this one specifically. And so I thought it was important to talk about. So the study is cardiometabolic effects of an omnivorous versus vegan diets in identical twins. And it was a randomized clinical trial. So moving to the summary, the vegan versus omnivore twin study can controlling for gene nutrient interactions uncover the best diet for heart health. In this eight-week randomized controlled study, a vegan diet reduced body fat, LDL cholesterol levels, and insulin when compared to an omnivorous diet. These findings were strengthened because the study participants were identical twins. So let's talk about it. So this was already a pretty short study. It was only eight weeks and they studied 40, they had 44 participants. There were 22 pairs of identical twins and their average age was 40. There were 34 women and 10 men. Now the participants were either assigned to a vegan diet, a healthy vegan diet, it says, or a healthy omnivorous diet. So like right there, intentionality was playing a factor. It wasn't like they were eating very like, low nutrient density vegan foods. 
the intervention was delivered in two four-week phases, one in which the meals were delivered to the participants and then one in which the meals were participant provided. Now, both diets were considered healthy as they emphasized the consumption of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains and discouraged the intake of refined grains, added sugars. In other words, the diets were similar except for the exclusion of animal-based foods in the vegan diet group, which included meats, poultry, fish, eggs, and dairy. So what is the big picture? What were the results? A big question in the nutrition field is, are plant-based diets heart healthier than omnivorous diets? Nutrition science has investigated this question for decades, and despite valiant research efforts, there is still no simple answer. There are a lot of studies that will have or support the idea that eating a plant-based diet is like healthier in regards to like lab values, and the question really comes into play, is it the food so much, is it the fact that they are excluding these kind of proteins, or is it because of other kind of factors at play? Like people who are intentionally following a plant-based diet typically are going to be more aware of their overall health. A lot of people won't put that much intention or that much like energy into a specific way of eating if they're also not doing other things. Like typically they tend to be more health conscious rather than people who aren't following any kind of more plant focused intake. There are going to be health conscious people in that group, hi, but there's also going to be a large percentage of those people who aren't focused on their health in any way, shape or form, which I mean, that's fine. That, you know, is fully their choice. What I'm saying though, is the percentages. Like if you're already doing something intentionally related to your health, what other kind of actions are you also doing that support physical health? Right, so there are so many confounding factors when it comes to interpreting those research results, the data. And actually, I'm just gonna read what they said because I just realized that this was part of the summary. So they say it's possible that people who are more conscious about their health choose to adopt a vegan or vegetarian diet for personal or environmental reasons. Maybe these people are also more likely to engage in positive health behaviors like non-smoking, moderating their alcohol intake, and exercising. Indeed, one population-based study concluded that vegetarians appeared more health conscious than non-vegetarians due to being more physically active and more likely to use supplements. On the other hand, most people who eat meat in some form, and some studies don't usually account for meat type, what the meat is served with, and other behaviors that meat eaters engage in. Observational studies aren't investigating a healthy omnivorous diet for the most part. They said it better than I did, but basically, yeah. So for that reason, the controlled or randomized controlled studies are the best way to study nutrition interventions, which is to assign two groups to two different diets for a set amount of time and observe what happens and the use of identical twins, it increases confidence in the findings observed in the studies that it wasn't due to like a genetic factor. All right, here's where we get into the interesting information though. The biggest hole in the study and one of the main points of criticism was a lack of caloric control, which resulted in the vegan diet consuming almost 200 kilocalories or calories less per day than the omnivore diet group, which on the surface, it doesn't sound like that much. Over time, that can make a difference. Difference. The average caloric intake across both study phases was 1,658 calories in the vegan diet group compared to 1,839 calories in the omnivore diet group. This calorie deficit explains a greater weight loss in the vegan diet group. Whether this weight loss came from fat mass or lean mass is unknown. So the researchers didn't measure body composition. So weight change was there, but was it muscle? Was it fat? We don't know. Additionally, the lack of statistically and clinically meaning differences between the groups may have been the result of a few factors. So first, the participants were cardiometabolically healthy at baseline. Their blood pressure was 124 over 75. Their fasting glucose was 91. They had a baseline LDL cholesterol of 115. Their BMI was 26. Because of these metrics not being elevated, it means that there was likely less room for them to improve overall. Second, the participants in both groups improved their diet quality. They increased their intake of vegetables and whole grains, and they reduced their added sugar intake, refined grains compared to the pre-study intake. A final note concerns diet satisfaction. 
though the objective health effects of any diet are important, so is the ability to sustain a diet long term, which is what we talk about on this channel so often. The vegan diet appeared at least marginally better for health, but how did the participants rate its acceptability? Overall, satisfaction with the vegan diet was lower than satisfaction with the omnivore diet. The lowest scored components of the vegan diet were eating out, planning, preparation of food, preoccupation with food. Only one participant in the vegan diet group said they would continue to closely follow all the recommendations for their eating pattern, compared to six participants in the omnivore group following the same thing. Had the study been isocaloric, so meaning that like the calories were the same, the outcomes may have been different. And also because the study was only eight weeks, it wasn't possible to measure clinical outcomes like cardiovascular disease events and all-cause mortality. For those reasons and more, the study still leaves a few more questions than answers about which diet is the healthiest. And something else to be aware of, Dr. Christopher Gardner, so he was a studies principal investigator and he received funding from the Beyond Meat Company. Although the study did not include Beyond Meat products specifically, which are plant-based uh, like meat alternatives like veggie burgers, it's just something to be aware of. Like we always wanna just be, be aware. It doesn't mean that the study was bad or anything. It's just awareness. So let me know if you learned anything in this video, if there was something that surprised you. Ultimately, nutrition is just, it's a science, so it's never going to be black or white. There are certain aspects that are going to have that, but when we're talking about the behaviorism side of things within nutrition especially, and just even like the biochemistry side of things, like there are always different factors at play. And so as with like other kind of sciences, we just need to remain open we need to be able to see the nuances and make sure also that like we never have this kind of idea that we know everything because while we do know a lot about nutrition there is so much room for growth in the study of nutrition. There is a lot of questions you can ask about nutrition related things that have not been studied yet. And that's one of the things that is so frustrating, but also really exciting. And just one reason why it's so important to be a lifelong learner. And that's also one of the reasons why it has, I think, taken me so long to feel more confident about my practice in nutrition because like it wasn't even until like five years in becoming a dietitian that I felt more confident. It's just a lot of information and I don't want to steer people in the wrong direction ever. So I don't take that kind of stuff lightly. All right. So that wraps it up for this video. Please leave a like if you like this. Make sure you're subscribed. I would greatly appreciate that. And remember, you can strive for health without subscribing to diet culture. I'll see you later. Bye.